I'm going to ask our first uh, panel to come up. You guys can you can be our inaugural panel for uh, Data Privacy Day. Just for everybody who's out there listening on the web, this is our first attempt to really do this uh, all day long uh, with a variety of topics. And we're going to jump right into, I think, a really, really exciting topic here this morning right away. But, um, and it's, we're going to look at, um, you know, really wearable tech and collegiate athletes. And then the question, is that a hitch for privacy? So we'll try to explore that. But I have a great, great panel here. I have Katrina Karzakis. Um, I don't think I quite did that Carcasus. right. Carcasus. You know, I practiced it before and then I screwed it up. Oh, sorry. Um, here, who's uh, a, a senior research scholar at the Center for Biomedical Ethics at Stanford, and Lisa Ho, who's a campus privacy officer at the UC Berkeley. So, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Really, really great to have you in here. So, let's just start from your vantage point. Um, what is going on with the state of wearables in collegiate athletes? I think we're really just dabbling in it now. It's a great time to be bringing up this subject because we are just emerging into that space, maybe unlike in professional athletes. We have budget considerations, so when we're asking where's the best place to spend our money, should we pay our should we give our athletes uh, food or should we suit them all up with, with wearables? I think uh, wearables not necessarily on the top of the priority list. So we're just starting on that conversation. So, but it's great. So it's great to be having this now when we're getting into it before we're behind the ball. Mm -hmm. I think if we look at where professional sport is gone, I talked to quite a few people that work with collegiate teams, but also pro teams. The collegiate teams are going exactly where pro sports is going. The more monitoring, the better. Bringing in new technologies to monitor all manner of health information, um, both during playtime, but also in off time. And in increasing, we're starting to see, I think, contracts between technology companies um, like Nike and universities to monitor players, uh, both on on time and off time. So I think it's an important moment to try to think about what should be done with those data and who should have access to it. So, I mean, tell me a little bit more about what, what is, what's, what's the goal in all this, right? So, and then um, what's the goal in trying to, you know, um, use these wearables uh, for collegiate athletes, both for the athlete and for the school, and maybe, you know, you indicated that there's some companies that are investing in this space as well. So, um, obviously, there are different reasons for people to participate in this. So, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I think there's really two major goals, um, performance improvement and injury prevention. And those sometimes can work at odds with one another, but that's essentially what they're trying to do, especially for sports like football, where there's such a high risk of soft, soft tissue injury. Yeah. So I think that that athlete, um, the coaches and trainers now see the use of the wearable technology as potentially an addition to what they're always doing already. And some coaches are on the cutting edge. They they really like this early adoption and want to use the technology um, and feel that there's getting these value value from it. Whereas the others are not. It hasn't collecting more data points has not shown to be proven that its value over the direct observation that they do as a normal coach. And maybe what they can see, um, if they were dr looking directly at an athlete, they might be able to understand things about it or recognize the fatigue or other injury kinds of things that maybe if they have the six or ten athletes that they're looking at, having the data points may be more helpful, may be helpful in getting there. But I, it comes back again to that value and the judgment assessment of is it are the risks associated with the wearable technology going to be... Um, uh, is they, are they, how do they weigh up against the benefits that you have from them? So, I mean, let's talk a little about the risks then. What are, the, what are some of the risks with this? And, um, you know, and, and how are the student athletes engaged in this process? Well, some of the risks are around ownership and control of the data and access to the data. And while the, if this is just emerging in the uh, uh, athletics, in the college, college space, it's very similar to what we see around learning data and the conversations that we're having a lot around how we access the student data, who owns that student data, and what for use, what uses can we put to them, them to. Um, it's, there's, there's multiple parties. There's the university who is collecting the data. There's the partners that we're working with, the vendors who help us in analyzing and collecting that data. And then there's the students themselves. And wh who has the, who has control over that? And, and Dr. Carcasey's research has, has spoken a lot to some of the, the different, um, 
uses that people can ha want and why they want to look at this technology for the students that are going to maybe to pro sports or the fantasy, um, fantasy uh, sports leagues. People want to look at that data. Should the students have access or have, be able to control that, perhaps monetize that on their own? The university is in an interesting space as maybe a steward of that data, or maybe they're, um, they're the customer as well of the vendor, or um, where, where do they fit in all these different pieces? And sometimes, even if we have contracts written that say the university holds our data, but the partners that we're working with also still have their use to make it improve their systems or whatever their, the services that they're providing to the university, what happens when that, that data that is coming from our players, our university, is also being used to prevent, to create algorithms and, and enhance their services that they are selling elsewhere? So we, there's things that we want to have. We want to make sure that we have access and are getting the best value for that data and that the students who are providing that data, the athletes, are, are, have some control over that as well and it's to their best interests. I would add one quick thing. Do I have a minute? Yeah. One of the baseline interests regarding these data is around validity of the data. So these companies use algorithms very often to have kind of a traffic light system about whether or not the athlete is fatigued or ready for play, what their load has been. But they're, um, those algorithms are private. And these technologies are not approved or tested or validated through an uh, organization like the FDA. So at baseline, what's happening is that we have trainers and others making decisions based on a sea of data. Everyone agrees there are too much data that they don't know how to interpret, hence the algorithms and the traffic light system. So I have heard many, many stories of coaches and others pushing athletes to injury because of incorrect use of the technology, in some cases season-ending injuries in the preseason. So this idea that it is for performance enhancement and injury prevention is an ideal. It's not clear that that's being actualized. So in addition to privacy, confidentiality, ownership of the data, third-party access, abilities to subpoena data, right, any number of things, and the expansion of what's being collected, we have at base a validity issue as well. So really interesting. And I think we'll come back to the student athletes in a second, but I, I want to talk about a, a specific case example. Um, Oral Roberts University um, actually requires, I believe, incoming freshmen now, maybe not I think it's optional for others uh, on the campus to actually wear, uh, have a wearable device. Um, they believe in the whole uh, body. They believe that, you know, um, the physical health is really as important as the intellectual growth. Um, and they track things like, I think they have a goal of 10,000 steps per day per student. They have a goal about heart rate. Um, they sometimes look at issues like weight and sleeping and other things. Um, you know, this seems, um, you know, different than probably when we went to college, right? Um, and certainly people weren't looking at those things about us. And does that, how does that change the environment for these young people? And, and what do you think about that notion of, you know, that college experience, including that, that kind of um, data collection? Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important to point out the difference in one university to another and that that, and things like data collection, what we stand, we take on ideas like that are indicative of the environment and of the experience that we're trying to have. If you make choose to go do service for your country, it can be Peace Corps or it can be the Army. There's different types of experiences that you're, that you're getting yourself into. And to understand if that's the, if, if Oral Roberts University, clearly as a private Catholic, um, Christian university, is going to have a different approach to their, to their students and their growth and what they're looking for in that. So it, I might, I always, Think about when what is the what is the role again of the university in this space? And in one sense, they're they're teachers and they're looking at what kind of information and helping your students grow. In the university, you're also potentially your landlord. That's in the, if you're living in the dorms, you could be your um, security officer when you're accessing buildings. You can be your meal plan, your restaurants. It can be your student conduct. You could have disciplinary um, roles of the university. You could be your loan financer. These are all different roles of the university. And so when the university has personal data such as that, it's a really um, interesting to think into how much data and how would you be using that data? Are there secondary uses besides just how many steps you took that that data could be used for? Can it be used for disciplinary action, for example? Yeah, I think, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, and it's not, uh, we'll go to you in a second. Uh, I think they use this also towards sort of the academic standing in some way, shape, or form, right? So it's not just 
collection and a goal. It's part of how you express how you're doing overall in the university. Is that correct? Or is that? Yeah, is that's that my understanding. That fitness is an important part of the whole body experience okay. and and being holistic in your development. It was actually uh, graded, right? So your fitness was graded. And within two or three months of when this was announced, the students started a change.org petition to stop it. Were they successful? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Someone Google it. <laughs> Just want to know, because we want to put every, all the tools into everybody's right. toolkit, right? I mean, so there's, there's that part about convenience, where I think the students before having Fitbits had to track in a book, yeah. how many steps did I take? And so there is, in our as we work in technology, things, oh, we could do this automatically and save a lot of time. So there is that benefit to weigh against what the risks are. Do you think it changes the relationship of the student to the university when that kind of data collection is going on? I think there's a power imbalance already. So depending upon the kind of sport that students participate in, for example, in pro sport, NFL players don't have nearly the power because of the structure of the contract to resist um, and say, I will not use these particular technologies on time, off time. Um, there are many stories of people just being benched if they won't use them. It's, so it's, it depends on the power structure. What I worry about with the students is that the universities have an incentive to monetize these data. And it's part of what will fund programs. So the NFL already has agreements in terms of their broadcasting in order to utilize these biometric data as part of the televised show. There is absolutely no reason, because it's worth so much money, that this will not happen at the collegiate level. It will. Um, the question is, we won't have the NCAA in place to be creating regulations about how these technologies will be used. There's no incentive for them to do it. And so then we're left at a school by school process to try to see how it is that the students might be represented and protected in terms of the uses of these data. Culture and what surveillance sets up for the culture is a really big question and a really big issue in, in higher education. Privacy is critical for creativity and for intellectual freedom. You need to, to develop ideas, you need time, you need the freedom to take risks. And that's part of the student experience, especially in the college years, that you have time to explore, go beyond the status quo, beyond the normal, and to try out things that are risky, that are, un, that are unusual, that are different. And that's with having a surveillance, it's, it's clear that when you're surveilled, you act in a different way than when you have freedom to act on your own without judgmental eyes. When, you, when you're ready to have those eyes upon you, that's when you should be able to be exposed. But there should be a freedom space where you can act and try out new ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the university experience. And so our athletes, our student athletes, are first and foremost students. And we need to protect that in the university space. Yeah, and there's certainly a difference between, you know, amateurs and professionals too, right? And obviously if someone goes on to professional sports, you know, they're signing away more than many, many different things, right? Um, and engaging in all different kinds of contract negotiations around, you know, their performance and, and those kinds of things and, and, and other things that they might have to do for a team, you know, including, you know, appearances and things like that that may come uh, with those efforts. So, you know, but back to the student athletes for a second. I mean, um, and we know obviously in the Oral Roberts example, that's kind of, you know, they're compelled, uh, you know, that's part of their agreement, you know, in coming and accepting the college. But, you know, student athletes in other places, uh, is any of this optional? Can they opt out? Um, and, and Yeah, definitely at Berkeley, we have 40 GPS units that are switched between our field hockey and our football teams. And students can opt out. For the most part, it seems that they opt out because they're uncomfortable or it's bothering them, rather than what's been brought up so far, privacy concerns. But these are on-field um, on field devices. They aren't things that they're being brought home to, to use and all night or tracking their heart rate. And as one of our trainers said to me, you know, I don't really want to know or even want to have to ask the question, why was your heart rate up at 1130 last night? You know, that's not a question that he wants to, to, wants to be asking. So they, there, I think there is definitely a concern and awareness that there's a different space around a professional athlete whose, whose singular job is to be performing at their elite, um, you know, their best, whereas in, in, there are different concerns and priorities in the college space. I would just say that um, it's going to be team and coach specific whether or not someone can opt out, right? So we can't generalize about yes or no. I, I absolutely know of teams at Stanford where um, one has a choice and others where one doesn't have a choice, right? And this is the same across other universities. So that's... Um, 
part of the issue for me is the element of choice. The other real possible harm, I think, for collegiate athletes is whether or not these data can be released in the context of a combine or something else in the case of the NFL that um, affects their ability to actually become professional. So, right, that is really a problem because there's almost unfettered access anyway to health information for uh, collegiate uh, football players, but is this one other element where people now feel they have a right to have access to these data? And they're not just health data. They can be geolocation, they can reveal things like uh, when you're sleeping and when you're not, where you are, where you've been. These data can also be subpoenaed. Yeah. So, I mean, that raises this really interesting question about like who owns this data, right? I mean, so I'm the athlete and I'm generating this data and you know, look, we know that a, a small percentage of these athletes are going to go on to be professionals, right? Um, they're not, certainly when you look at sports like, you know, baseball or football, I mean, maybe some people, you know, in other sports might go to be in the Olympics or something, you know, in those kinds of, so it's a small percentage of these where that data, you know, really makes a difference as they move up. But so what happens? Who owns it? You know, now I was, I was at, you know, Acme University. I was a student athlete. I generated you know, 500 gigabytes of data about my athletic experience, right, while I was on campus, and then what happens? Yeah. It's really hard to get a straight answer about who owns it. So there was a panel on this precise issue around privacy and ownership um, at South by Southwest, and I asked the question, and I got three different answers. So it's contract specific, right? The companies have an incentive to own the data for many reasons, but you, everyone that I've talked to that is in the field and inside the companies feels that the players should own their own data, right? That this is very personal information about you that you should have control over, including accessing it, right? So. The other real issue that we haven't talked about is security, which is so essential because this is being transmitted over Bluetooth and other ways. And so sometimes people can control who has access on their phone, but very often not. So what is the security like at rest and in transit? And what kinds of best practices are there around that? Well, it's company specific. So, you know, you're, you're saying it's company specific, so I think maybe you could explain what that means because I think people might not quite get what some of these relationships that are developing between the institutions and the companies that are collecting the data and what they're trying to do. So, what, I mean, either of you, please. Well, I, I, the um, contracts around wearable technology, as they say, they're negotiated school by school and it would depend on what the standards are for the schools. And when we have our standard te standard technology contracts or data contracts, we say that the data is the universities and it belongs to us. That's an interesting point because what happens when we get to, that right now it's kind of an enterprise environment where the university is acting on behalf of the athletes and a steward of the data. But as we've seen in learning data, this has transferred or evolved to where actually the companies are going directly to students, learning management companies will um, have a click through because it's now free, it's come down in price to be a free, uh, cons almost like a consumer provided service. And so you can see that happening very easily in the wearable space as well because it costs money to go into the enterprise contract. So when it happens just or Fitbits that you want to use in a consumer level or the technology gets better and it's at a consumer level where the companies are going directly to the students, cutting out the contract uh, writing protections that are involved when you have an enterprise level kind of agreement. And in that case, what what is the athlete going to have in the ability to say, oh, well, you're supposed to be on the team and we're all doing this. So just go and click and, and get that get that um, you know agreement and start using that and click through and then how much are they going to be aware of paying attention to and feel the ability to stand up and say no actually this is not what I want to want to use and when those click through agreements almost certainly would be the, the data owned by the company that's collecting. Yeah, well, I mean that, that sort of raises an, another question for me too around this because. Um, even if it was opt-in or optional, right, um, in some way, shape, or form, if you're on a team and, you know, and there's 45 people on the team and you're the one person who says, you know what, I'm not going to wear that thing, mm -hmm. right, Does, uh, is, is that going to change your relationship to your team, to your coaches, or possibly impact, you know, your future? I mean, is, is, the, 
is the need to do it so compelling that there really isn't an opt-in in a way? I'm not saying necessarily at Berkeley, but I mean in this more broader, yeah. you know, kind of kind of environment. Like, you know, if you're if you opt 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 out is available, but it's not a reality in in most cases. And is that a it's an issue that highly individual, face? right? It depends again on who the coach is and and who it is that's monitoring these activities. But there's already an inherent power imbalance, and I think not to. Um, in any way disparage universities, but I don't think we should start from the assumption that they will protect the interests of the students. There are conflicts of interest and competing interests for the university. So what I really wonder is, what are the students being told? When you have a 10-year contract that is going forward and you can have updates to apps that might expand, right, and technologies of what's getting monitored, the language that I've seen in these contracts is incredibly broad. What I have learned over the past year is that a great deal changes in a year, right? So 10 years uh, going forward, what, is, what does that mean and what do you tell the students? And the students want to perform well, right? There is, I think, a push for them to think that there are only upsides to these technologies. And there are upsides. I don't mean to sound you know, like it's all gloom and doom. But I think that the risks and the possible harms need to be very carefully articulated to the students so that they can exercise their autonomy regarding choice. Yeah, it's clear that there's a lot of pressure in, in college that to do what's, what your peers are doing. And particularly in a team environment, that's going to be even stronger. Um, I, I think all the, the contract, for example, at, at Michigan, it's, it does ask for, it says that the university needs to approve what what data use is going to be, data is being collected. And so that, that's a kind of key point there is for universities to have some kind of um, structure or governance process to ask these questions and say, how is the data going to be used? How long is it going to be kept? How is it going to be protected? What rights do students have in accessing or deleting or not using this data? That, that governance process is really key here, that we don't just let these things happen ha happenstance because the money looks good, or whatever kind of conflicting priorities may come into play. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, do you think having all this data creates any liability for the colleges um, in any way, shape, or form? Well, whatever data you have, you have to protect. Right. And it becomes on the university's responsibility to be protecting that. If there is a breach like any other kind of personal information, it's the university that comes back into the news. Even if it was, if it was company X that actually held the data, the university is the one whose name is in the spotlight that breached the data that let down the students and created this problem. So, um, you know, let's as we sort of move toward the end here, uh, think a little bit about um, maybe some, and I know in, in your paper you outlined um, kind of like a little bit of a framework mm -hmm. even for people to start to sort of address. We sort of talked about sort of, you know, a wide ranging area issues here. What, what's your notion about how colleges and universities could start to address this issue in a more organized fashion mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I think you have some ideas about some criteria and some other things. Maybe you could mm -hmm. share that. Well, actually, piggybacking on what Lisa said, governance is key, right, and what best practices are. And so one of the really intriguing things to me is that the um, National Basketball Players Association just is in the process of renegotiating their collective bargaining agreement. And so they will be talking about how it is that these technologies can be used. And my understanding is at this point in time, they're going to have a wearables committee. And so everything that might get used in the NBA will go through this wearables committee. I don't think that that's something that the NCAA would do, but I also don't think that it's not possible to have it done outside of the NCAA, so it wouldn't have the power or authority coming from them, but a committee that would look at validity, right, would look at some of the claims being made by the technology companies and trying to vet that, because they're, they're coming out as quickly as they're failing. In the course of writing my paper over a year and a half, I had to take three companies out because they had failed and closed on the product. Product, right? What happens to the data then? I, I, I don't know. So questions around security practices, who can see the data, can the athlete control these data on time, off time, right, meaning playing, not playing. Um, all of these issues need to be done, uh, dealt with. And ideally, I'd like to see best practices across NCAA universities. Um, 
there's not really a mechanism set up in order to do that, but we definitely have governance models outside of sport that, that best practices are, you know, it's already been talked about, right? It just needs to be implemented in some way. Yeah, together with all of the governance that we do around data, at learning data, together with, with wearables, any kind of data that we're collecting, it comes back to those governance questions that we should have a process for handling that because they're not going away. So we need to look at what is the utility? Is it something that we need to be doing that is worth the risks to it? And what can happen to the data in the various cases of not just what we expect it to be used by, but the unexpected and the required or any subpoena or if it's hacked or if we're partners are using it, we need to look at that data and look at the scope of what what's the appropriate scope for, for collecting that data. Do we need to be doing it all night and all day, mm -hmm. or is it just while they're on the field? And making sure that we're transparent and having that part of our governance process accountable and transparent as mm -hmm. part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually this is, I mean, this is a little, I didn't, you know, a, a little below the college level, but as we're sitting here and we're talking, I'm thinking, you know, about um, now you're going to start accepting people into colleges and they're going to be coming from high schools, right? Yeah. And the high schools will be collecting the data and will that data be used, you know, to evaluate whether someone should get like a sports scholarship or some, those oh. kinds of things. And I, I mean, is that, already, is that already happening? Yeah, it's already happening in high school. Oh no, we're, we're the, yeah, the, we're already on a fast moving train. Yeah. 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 So I think, um, you know, as, as we sort of close up here, I just wonder if there's, you know, any advice that you have um, for institutions. Obviously, you've already been giving a great deal of thought of this, and I'm sure a lot of institutions have, but there may be some that are, you know, a as in any ecosystem, there are larger enterprises and smaller enterprises, and, you know, some may be in different states of awareness, A, of the issue, um, and B, of, you know, starting to put in procedures in place. Any broad sweeping advice um, for your colleagues out there in um, collegiate athlete world uh, about where they should start if they haven't started at all? I think I would go back to that governance process that's not just about athletics and you can have, there's so many so many things and so many places that we can collect data that have that kind of process in place to be looking at the utility and the scope and all the risks, not just for athletics because if you're gonna have it next case in a different area. So if you already have that structure in place, you'll be set when these questions come through. I'd like to see every university have a wearables committee that comprises people with different expertise, ethics, medicine, the relevant sciences, law. It's the, the expertise is already available at the university, so this isn't hard. That's a great point. Well, on that, I think we'll close, we'll close off. Oh, <laughs> the bell has rung, or at least it didn't ring my bell. The bell has rung. Um, and uh, so I just want to thank uh, Lisa and uh, Katrina. This, Katrina, this is great. This is, this is a really interesting discussion, and I think a great first discussion for Data Privacy Day about where the rubber really hits the road for a very specific group of people um, who will have to be challenged you know, with these issues going forward. So thank you very much. You. Yeah. And um, we'll move right on to our next session here. So quick change-o, presto change-o. Yeah, give them a big hand here. Give them a big hand.